When we were in college, my husband, before he was my husband, used to tease me by saying I had no need for mind-altering substances because I already saw the world as if I was high. I am naturally amazed and delighted by almost everything around me. A pigeon pecking at a stale hot dog bun can bring tears to my eyes, and I naturally find something to love in every single book that I read. So as you can imagine, it is extremely difficult for me to put together a best of list for an entire year. <laughs> am I basically telling you I have no taste? Why am I telling you this? I do have 11 books that I read in 2023 that I feel like I have a little bit more to say about, which I think is a good a measurement or criteria as any for putting together a favorite books of the year list. If a book continues to give me more things to think about, that must mean it looms large in my imagination. Because I focus on supporting independent publishers on this this channel. All of these books are indeed from independent publishers, but I'm also going to share one title from each of these publishers that is either recently published or forthcoming from that publisher that I have not yet read. Because my entire shtick here is that if you find one book that you love from a smaller publisher, chances are you're going to really love other books that they publish. What's first? What book should we talk about first? Should we talk about the Wall. I have a helper over there who's playing Minecraft. The Wall by Marlon Haushofer. It sounds good to start off. Good. First up is The Wall by Marlon Haushofer, and this is translated by Sean Whiteside, and it was originally published in 1963 and has been reissued by New Directions. This is known as a feminist classic. It's written in diary entries and tells the story of a woman who has gone on vacation with her friends in a hunting lodge in the Austrian Alps and she wakes one morning to find that her friends haven't returned home from dinner in the nearby town and when she goes to investigate she finds that an invisible wall has emerged that is surrounding her and the hunting lodge and the mount hill mountains and valleys around her in in the alps and she comes to realize that possibly the other people on the other side of the wall are no more this is the story of her trying to survive on her own with her only companions, a cat, a dog, and a cow. I'll say one of my favorite aspects of this novel is how attached you become to these animal characters. So this book asks the question, what happens when a woman can build her own life outside of the world's definitions of what it means to be a woman. Her identity is no longer based on what other people define for her because there are no other people. But this situation opens the door to an even bigger question that I think is often ignored in some of the critical reviews I read covering this novel. No one is around to define our narrator as a woman. That means no one is around to define her as a human either. So the novel asks if all other humans are gone, what is left of your humanity? How do you maintain your humanity and does it even matter? What are your obligations as a human to other creatures? Or are you just another creature? Is the fact that she's writing this down, that she's compelled to tell a story out of it, compelled to record it, is that what makes her human? And if so, what happens when she runs out of paper? So you got the age old question, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's around to hear it, does it make a sound? If a woman is the last woman on earth and no one is around to define her, is she a woman? If a human is the last woman on earth and no one is around to define her as a human, is she a human and does it matter? I don't think the novel answers those questions. In fact, I think it provides multiple answers to those questions and that's what made it such a rewarding experience for me. Before I share one more book that I haven't read from New Directions, I have one more book I read this year that was among my favorites from New Directions. Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melchor and it's translated by Sophie Hughes. This takes place in a village in Mexico and the body of a person known in the local community as the witch is found by a group of teenagers. And over the course of the novel, through four to five different 
perspectives, different point of views, you get closer and closer to the actual story of what happened to the witch and who the witch even is within this community. This is a brutal depiction of poverty and violence. And what was so compelling about this novel for me and what makes me continue to think about it is its structure. I love the way this novel evokes the winds of a hurricane through both the sentence structure, which includes extremely long, relentless sentences that just keep going and going and, and don't give you any kind of a break or a breather, like the winds of a hurricane. But also the structure of the point of view changes that you get in this novel, which circle ever closer to the center of the hurricane, which is the witch. And the witch herself is never, you never get the witch's perspective, like the quiet, silent eye of a hurricane. Everyone else is giving you the story of the witch. And as you get closer and closer and closer to her st story, things get more and more and more intense. I'm getting chills just talking about how that structure is used to tell this very particular story. So two books from New Directions, warrants two books to mention that they have forthcoming in February, I believe, by Indigenous Australian author Alexis Wright. The most recent of her novels called Praiseworthy, and then a novel that was published a while ago, I think, I wanna say like 2006 or something, called Carpentaria. Both novels are epic tales of Australia and of Aboriginal life, and Alexis Wright is an award-winning writer, and New Directions, sent around in their newsletters. I highly recommend subscribing to independent publishers' newsletters. They are so great with juicy details. Apparently, New Directions tried to acquire Carpentaria when it first came out, but they were outbid originally. And so now with Alexis Wright's new novel, Praiseworthy, they've acquired the rights to publish Carpentaria as well, right alongside Praiseworthy. So both novels are coming out at the same time. Should we talk about Polak's Arm next? Should we? This is a novel called Polak's Arm. It's by Hans von Trotta and it's translated by Elizabeth Laufer. And this is published by New Vessel Press. And I first learned about this book because it was longlisted and then shortlisted by a prize called the Republic of Consciousness Prize, which is a prize that started in the UK several years ago and is dedicated to small presses. Last year, 2023, was the inaugural, inaugural year for the US and Canada prize, our branch of the Republic of Consciousness prize. And Pollock's Arm was one of my favorite reads from the short list. This is a novel that is based on a true person named Ludwig Pollock, and he was an antiquities dealer and famous cataloger of antiquities. And his most famous act was that he discovered the missing arm from a very famous Greek sculpture called the Laocoon. It is hard to pronounce. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right. The novel takes place on October 16th, 1943. And Ludwig Polak and his family lived in Rome at the time. True, this truly happened. The Vatican sent an emissary, sent a messenger from the Vatican to Polak's home in Rome to warn him and his family that the Nazis were planning on rounding up the Jews in Rome the, the next day or within the next few days that the Vatican had received word that this was happening. And the Vatican was offering Pollock and his family safe refuge within the walls of the Vatican. We don't know what actually happened in that conversation. All we know is that Pollock and his family did not go to the Vatican and they were in fact sent the next day, I believe um, the Nazis arrested them and put them on a train to Auschwitz where they were murdered. So that is the true story. What this novel is, is a fictional imagining of that emissary. It's a report. The emissary is reporting to his um, Monsignor, to his superior back at the Vatican, what that com what conversation he actually had with Pollock. He went to his house to try to convince him to come to the Vatican, and this is a recounting of the conversation that they had. What is so brilliant about this novel and why it is so affecting for me is the use of point of view serves as a constant reminder that we don't have Pollock's actual story. We don't have the story of what happened that night because 
Pollack was murdered with, along with his family. The novel never lets you forget that this is a fictional account. The emissary constantly is saying things like, he's talking, he's telling his life story as if I'm not even in the room. He's looking out the window. He won't even look at me. He's just, it's like he's talking like I'm not even there. And it's just a constant reminder that this emissary is in fact fictional. He wasn't in the room. This is Hans von Trotha writing the novel. He's, this is fiction. He wasn't in the room. The author wasn't in the room and this fictional character wasn't actually in the room. I think that's really beautifully done and the ending is very emotional and powerful as well. So one more from New Vessel, a novel called The Words That Remain by Stenio Gardel, a Brazilian writer, and it's translated from the Portuguese by Bruna Dantas Lobato. This is the story of Raimundo, who is an elderly man and who for decades has longed to read a letter that he received from his lover, Cicero. But until recently, Raimundo hasn't been able to read. So this is described as sweeping, heartbreaking, and deceptively simple story of queer desire and survival. Next up, we have a novel called In the Distance. A lot of people have read this one. Uh, is this right side up? Yes. I know a lot of folks have loved this book. Uh, this is In the Distance by Hernan Diaz, and this is published by Coffeehouse Press. And this tells the story of Hauken, who is, starts out in the beginning of the novel as a young boy from Sweden who has arrived on a ship in California, penniless and unable to speak English. He sets off on foot to try and find his brother who he believes is in New York. So Hauken is in California, he thinks his brother is in New York, and he thinks that he can walk there. And this is the story of all of the danger, all of the characters, all of the dangerous characters that Hauken meets along the way. This is a great adventure. It's just a, it's just a great, story. I have a video recently about like the road trip novel. I feel like this can fall into the category of a great American road narrative. Kind of have this this quest going on in the background, but it becomes more a story about the journey itself. And my favorite part of this novel is how rich it is with the themes of America. It is about power, it is about money, it is about myth-making in America, specifically in the American West at this time. It is also about who has the power to tell your story. It, it's about power dynamics. Who has the power to tell any, any story within America and who does not have the power to control their own narrative. I read this right before I read Trust, which was the Pulitzer Prize winning novel. And even though they are very, take place in very different places, they have a lot in common when it comes to these themes of power and money and who has the power and money to tell their story or to manipulate someone else's story. So on theme with each other, they're great to read back to back. So one more from Coffeehouse Press coming out in April by Danielle Dutton. And this caught my eye because Danielle Dutton is the author of Margaret the First, which is a short novel that I have been wanting to read for a really long time. But this new book coming out in April from Coffeehouse Press is a brilliantly odd sounding book called Prairie Dresses Art other. Here's what Coffee House Press says about the book. Prairie is a cycle of surreal stories set in the quickly disappearing prairie land of the American Midwest, right up my alley. Dresses offers a surprisingly moving portrait of literary fashions. Art turns to essay, examining how works of visual art and fiction might relate to one another. And the final section, Other, includes pieces of irregular other forms, such as stories as essays or essays as stories that defy category and are hilarious and heartbreaking by turns. My other favorite book from the Republic of Consciousness Prize, which actually took a while to sit with me for me to determine that it was my other favorite book from that prize is The Sleeping Car Porter by Suzette Mayer and this is from Coach House Books. This won the Giller Prize and I guess in 2023 uh, so Lots of people already know about it and, and love this book. It takes place in 1929 on a train that is traversing Canada, and it tells the story of Baxter, who is a porter on this train, and specifically a sleeping car porter. Baxter 
has a deep love for science fiction. He is also hiding a secret about himself that if it is exposed, it could get him fired from his job, which would be dev especially devastating because he is desperately trying to save up money to go to dental school. What I love most about this book and what has stuck with me over time are the craft choices. And specifically within this book, it is the expert building of tension. So you have this physical space that is building tension. You have passengers and workers stuck on a train together in a tight space. You have Baxter who is working uh, nearly 24 hour shifts. So you have tension building from exhaustion. Then you also have just this brilliant structure of points that, not points, demerits. So if Baxter earns a certain number of demerits from mistakes or whatever stupid things he gets demerits for, he can be fired. But he's also trying to save like a really specific exact amount of money to go to dental school. So you have like this getting, getting tips and earning incrementally money to go to the to dental school alongside these demerits that which are increasing in number and so that builds tension as well and then point of view i think is expertly deployed in this novel as well so this is i i'm pretty sure the novel is all in close third so it's all it's third person but told from Baxter's perspective and so the physical descriptions of other characters are based on what Baxter would notice first and I think that's what shows a masterful writer is that okay it's Baxter's point of view so we need the reader needs to see what Baxter would see and what is that for Baxter their teeth because he wants to be a dentist. One more from Coach House Books coming in February is Pale Shadows by Dominique Fortier. And this is translated by Rhonda Mullins. This is actually a follow-up to Fortier's previous novel called Paper Houses. Pale Shadows is the fictionalized story of the three women who brought Emily Dickinson's poems out of the shadows after her death. And these three women were the ones navigating the male-dominated publishing world in order to give public and enduring life to Dickinson's poetry. Next up, we have a memoir called Strip. And this is by Hannah Sword. And this is published by Tortoise Books. So this memoir starts with Hannah's childhood. As a young girl, her mother and father split up and she went to mostly live with her father who is a poet and she kind of had this very bohemian lifestyle to her childhood. And when Hannah was a young child, she was molested. And so there's that is an element that is explored in the memoir as well. And so you follow Hannah through childhood, through young adulthood. She, des she and her sister desperately want to be actors, so they move to California. Eventually they become strippers and Hannah turns to prostitution to earn money as well. She becomes addicted to crystal meth. All along she has these dreams of being an actor, of being a writer, and I will say that this memoir as devastating as it is, as hard as it is to read, it does end on a hopeful note. What I so desperately loved about this memoir was the way the author builds the different worlds that she is moving in and out of all across the country. The physical spaces are described so vividly. And what I loved even more were the people, and the portraits of the people in her life that she described, whether they're people who were with her from childhood, her sister, her parents, or there are people who had fleeting moments in her life. Every single person is just described and painted so beautifully and so well. It was a true privilege to be able to read Hannah Sword's story. So I'll just end by saying that this is a beautifully written memoir. One more from Tortoise Books. There you have a novel that I think just came out it's either coming out soon or it just came out, called The Quail Who Wears the Shirt by Jeremy T. Wilson. The author was in my writing program way back in the day, and I highly doubt he would remember me because I was very shy and didn't talk to anyone ever. But I do remember being extremely intimidated by how 
amazing of a writer he was. So what Tortoise Books has to say about the quail who wears the shirt. Tuesday night is trivia night, a night for produce market owner Lee Hubs to swing by the bar with his cop friend, a night to down a few shots and avoid all the folks who've mysteriously been turning into quails. But this Tuesday's different and I think I'll leave it there and keep you wondering about this people turning into quail situation. Next up we have The Art of Libromancy by Josh Cook and this is published by Biblioasis and this is a collection of essays that are from a longtime bookseller and co-owner co and co-owner of an independent bookstore in Massachusetts. And a lot of these essays are a great behind the scenes look at what it is like to work and own a, an independent bookstore. What I especially appreciated about this collection of essays is the exploration of the amount of bias that is baked in, built into the publishing industry every step of the way from who even gets to be a writer in the first place or is encouraged to be a writer in the first place all the way up to what books make it onto the front tables of your favorite bookstore. There is bias at every step of the way and there is white supremacy at play every step of the way. So I believe that The Art of Libromancy is a great book for anyone who promotes books on any platform. For me, I had a lot to learn and a lot to think about in terms of what books I am reading, what books are marketed to me that make it onto my own bookshelves, and then in turn, what books I am talking about to other people. If you wanna learn more, I have an entire video about this book, so I will leave a link to that below. One more from Biblioasis, which is an incredible Canadian publisher. On January 23rd, they are publishing a book called The Utopian Generation by Pepe Tella, and it's translated by David Brookshaw. The Utopian Generation is considered in the Portuguese-speaking world an essential novel of African decolonization. I'm going to read here from the publisher. It says, Lisbon, 1961. To escape surveillance by the dictatorship's secret police, African students meet at the Casa, a campus club where they dream of the homelands they will free from colonialism. Following four young revolutionaries who dream of building an epic campaign for a liberated socialist Angola, the utopian generation charts the intertwined destinies of Sarah, an idealistic doctor, Annabal, an intense intellectual, Vitor, an aspiring political leader, and Malongo, a party-hopping soccer player. Next up, we have The Lost Journals of Sacagawea. This is a novel by Deborah Magpie Erling and it was published by Milkweed in 2023. Erling takes what very little is known of Sacagawea's story and then imagines the rest of it. This starts out with the daily life of Sacagawea as a young girl. She's Lemmy Shoshone and lives in the upper Salmon River Basin in what is present day Idaho. The novel then follows as Sacagawea is abducted by the Hidatsa and then is taken to North Dakota and is sold to a French Canadian fur trader. And then of course follows as her husband, a French Canadian fur trader, joins the Lewis and Clark expedition of 1804 to 1806. This is a difficult read. First, from a purely syntax point of view and language choice point of view, it's very unique. I recommend giving it time to get into the rhythm of it. It's one of those things where once you just keep reading and get into the rhythm, you absorb what's going on, despite the difficulty of the syntax, the uniqueness of the syntax, I would say, and of the language. And I think there's a certain temptation, at least there was for me initially, a certain temptation to try and figure out exactly what was going on and to figure out what was happening in reality versus what was maybe a dream or a vision. And then also what certain words might mean and the context in which they occur. But I think part of the point of this book is that it is not appropriate for me to determine what is real and what is not real for Sacagawea. It is also very difficult to read in terms of the physical and sexual violence that occurs in this novel. It is 
It is brutal. There is no holding back from it. This book is incredibly powerful and moving and has such a unique voice that you aren't gonna find, I don't think, in any other novel. It's truly a singular reading experience. Sometimes what I like to do, I learned this from, I forget what the interview was, but there was an interview on Between the Covers, my favorite podcast of all time, and the author mentioned something about every book has one sentence within it that is the defining sentence of that book. And so sometimes when a sentence really strikes me, I, I realize that that is the book's defining sentence. And that happened. It was like a, being hit by a lightning bolt in this book. So it actually wasn't one sentence. It was like a series of three or four sentences. Okay, it's on page 225. Do not trust anyone who tells you you cannot tell your story. Do not trust anyone who tells you there is only one story. If there were only one story or one way of seeing things, all stories would die. And that is what this book is about. One more from Milkweed. House of Caravans, a novel by Shilpa Suneja, is a novel that takes place in India over two different time periods. So it starts out in 1943 and the years leading up to partition and then also shifts to 2002 in the aftermath of 9-11. And the both time periods follow families who are impacted by the legacy of colonialism and sectarian violence. Next up is a book that I was going to include whether I finished it or not in 2023, and I did finish it in 2023, thank goodness. So this is The Parisian by Isabella Hamad, and this is published by Grove Press. This is the story of Midhat, who is the son of a well off textile merchant in Palestine and the book opens in 1914 when Midhat is sent to Paris to study medicine. He's sent off at the beginning of World War I. Well, actually, he's outside of Paris. He's not in Paris initially. <laughs> he's sent to France. And while in France, he has this really unique experience of being one of the only young men around who is not at war. So you follow him as he's studying medicine and as he's falling in love both with France, but then also with a French young woman. After the war, when he returns to Nablus, which is where his family lives, he returns to a Palestine that is under British rule. And from there, Midhat's story and his family's story develops alongside the political and historical story of Palestine as it fights to become a nation. So the, the novel really starts out as a Billings Roman from, you know, mostly Midhat's point of view. And I have a great quote from the author. This is from an interview with World Literature Today. Midhat does start out like the protagonist of a European buildings roman, leaving home to define himself as an individual in the world. A buildings roman usually involves some kind of reconciliation with society and society's values. And in this case, that classical narrative of the buildings roman is disrupted by Midhat's awakening to the fact that he is not considered an equal in his environment, in French society. He is not considered an individual, but rather as a type of person, racially, culturally, religiously. You could say that Midhat initially embraces a model of Western individualism, which he then realized doesn't apply to him because the model of the Western individual is only available to the white European or American. But when Midhat returns to Palestine, he doesn't really fit in there either anymore. And his family and his friends refer to him as the Parisian because he has so fallen in love with French culture and language and fashion. And so that's where the title comes from. But once Midhat returns to Palestine, the novel shifts to not just be primarily Midhat's point of view. There are many point of view shifts, and so it becomes much more of a story about the community and the historic struggle they find themselves in. In interviews, Hamad has explained that as a child she didn't know much about the history of Palestine before the Nakba of 1948, and so this novel really grew out of her desire to learn more about the even earlier origins of Palestine. One of the most, I thought, delightful things about this book is when you open it, it has a long, long list of characters. And in fact, many reviews compare it to sweeping novels of the 19th century. One more from Grove Press, one more that came out this year that I want to read is 
Isabella Hamad's newest book called Enter Ghost, which is the story of a production of Hamlet that a group of characters are putting on in Palestine. And so it is the story of, of one character who I believe returns, she's, she lives in the UK and returns to Palestine and is convinced to be part of this production of Hamlet. Second to last book, we have a poetry collection called From From. This is written by Monica Yoon and published by Grey Wolf Press. And I believe this came out in 2023. I'm gonna read what Grey Wolf's website has to say about the title. So it says, where are you from? No, where are you from from? It's a question every Asian American gets asked as part of an incessant chorus saying, you'll never belong here, you are a perpetual foreigner, you'll always be seen as an alien, an object, or a threat. This poetry collection is incredible. Monica Yoon is, um, was a lawyer and a lot of the poems, this is gonna sound so odd unless you have read it, a lot of the po poems, the way they kind of construct an argument step by step reads like a lawyer who knows what they're doing and knows how to make an argument wrote that poem. I think one of the most important aspects for me of this poetry collection is that it implicates me very overtly as a white person reading a poetry collection by an Asian American writer. As the very first poem lays out, I am coming in almost as like a tourist. I can come in and, and learn about someone whose experience with race is different than my own, and then I can hop back out of that experience. So I'll quote from the first poem, study of two figures, Pacifaye and Sado. So bo both figures are considered Asian, one from Colchis, one from Korea. To mention the Asian-ness of the figures creates a racial marker in the poem. This means that the poem can no longer pass as a white poem, that different people can be expected to read the poem, that they can be expected to read the poem in different ways. To mention the Asian-ness of the figures is also to mention by implication the Asian-ness of the poet. Revealing a racial marker in a poem is like revealing a gun in a story or like revealing, <clears throat> I'm not gonna read, my son is in the room, so I'm gonna finish that line. Buy the collection and you can read it. So basically the point is, race is a container and as soon as you bring up race in a poem you put the poem in a in that container in that racial container and you also put the poet in that container defined by race as a white person reading the poem i can come and go from that container i am not contained within that container no one reading this collection can read it within a position of comfort I, you, if you are a white person reading the collection, you are cognizant of your white privilege and your ability, like your choice, like why did you pick up this collection? Like why, you know, are you attempting to be some kind of tourist to learn about people other, the, who are different than you? Even me telling you at the beginning of talking about this book, the meaning behind the title, I was putting, I even just taking that description from Grey Wolf's website, I was putting this book in a container. I was telling you that this is a collection about an Asian American experience. And so that is what this book just brings to light is what the collection brings to light is the container that is race and depending on who you are, what your position is with regards to that container. It's brilliant. One more from Grey Wolf. Coming out January 23rd is a, an anthology of poems called Raised by Wolves. And this is to celebrate Grey Wolf's 50th anniversary. And it's 50 Grey Wolf poets have selected 50 poems by other Grey Wolf poets. And it includes an introduction from these poets about why they selected each of those poems. Before I tell you about my final favorite book of the year, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. Thank you for joining me over the past year. Thank you for joining me today. I know how busy life can be, so the fact that you took any time out of your day to watch this video about books is just mind-boggling to me. Some of these books that I've mentioned are already pretty decently popular, but some deserve so much more attention, so I hope you'll check them out. In the description below, I've included a bookshop.org link that includes all of my favorite books of the year, plus a bunch of honorable mentions as well. So finally, 
of my favorite books of the year, the last remaining book to tell you about is Sister Golden Calf by Colleen Burner, and this is published by Split Lip Press. And this is the story of two sisters, Gloria and Kit, who have set off on kind of aimless road trip after the sudden death of their mother across the desert landscape and highways of New Mexico. I loved this book so much. Like I said in a previous video, this slim novel feels like it contains an entire desert highway. If you want to hear more about this book, including the huge surprise it gave me at the end after I finished the book and realized something about the book that I didn't realize while reading it, check out my recent video where I talk all about this book and the general lack of female road narratives in American fiction. But I also want to tell you about one more book from Split Lip before I go, and that is a collection of stories called Midwatch, and this is by Jillian Denback McGon. This is coming out on February 6th, and these short stories tell the often overlooked stories of women service members. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Sarah. Happy 2024. I'll talk to you later. Bye!